Jordan some nifty moves at midfield. Boyd breaks out of another tackle. Boyd still on his feet. Boyd. Ten. Five. Wow. Touchdown. A run. When he left, I couldn't even face this university no more. I felt like I couldn't face his mother. I couldn't face any of my teammates. From the first day I, I got introduced to, you know, adversity, you know, no one walked me through it, no one guided me through it, you know, it was just, it'll be okay, play football and it'll be okay. From a young age, Corey Boyd knew his life's path was going to be different than most. His story begins in the projects of Orange, New Jersey, a city about two miles wide with not a lot of opportunities to make it out. Boyd's mother was left to raise him with the help of his grandmother. The only time his father came around was in high school when he would see Corey's name in the papers. His mother did what she could do to get by, but it made for a rough upbringing. I remember times where me and my mother were padlocked out. We were homeless, you know. I was only about seven or eight years old, you know, not knowing why we had to huddle up in the hallway or, you know, I had to go spend the night with my aunt while my mother went out in the streets and did whatever she needed to do to provide for His mother always told him that it was herself and Corey against the world. But on his ninth birthday, he found himself alone. His first time meeting adversity. Unfortunately, you know, on my ninth birthday, I, I lost my mother uh, for the next five years, which was pretty tough, you know, at that age. You know, my mom used to always, before she left, she used to always tell me it was her against the world. It was many nights, it was, it was many nights where I couldn't sleep. You know, I was, I was terrified, you know, that you know, not only did I not have my mother, you know, I didn't have my father, you know, I felt like nobody wanted me. But somebody did want him. And that person was Willie Graves, Boyd's older cousin. Graves was a star football player who was gaining attention from Division I schools for his talents on the field. He was Boyd's first role model. Really changed my life. He, uh, he was that father figure at a time where I didn't have a father. You know, he would check up on me, making sure I was doing push-ups. He would check up on me, make sure I would do homework, making sure that my grades was on point. Because he said at one time, he said, if you're going to be anything like me, man, you got to make sure that you got good grades, man. You got to make sure that you dominate on the field. And, uh, you know, that stayed with me because he was the only person at a time where you know, when I lost my mom and my dad wasn't there and my uncles wasn't giving me guidance, nobody was giving me guidance, they were just pointing the finger. You know, he was the only person that pulled me aside and taught me something. Taught me about being a man at that young age. and Taught me about being a student athlete at that young age. Boyd wore the same number three as Graves did all the way through his professional career. But Graves never got the chance to see Boyd play. It would be Boyd's second time running into adversity. On December 29th, 1996, Boyd's uncle came into the house with the tragic news that Willie Graves had been shot. Once my uncle told me that, I jumped, in the I jumped out of the closet with a bat, and naturally I took off running. He ran hard, he ran fast, and he ran with a purpose. What happened next would change his life. I saw him. I saw him laying there on his back uh, in front of the phone. And, you know, the crowd was ridiculous. You know, people cursing, people fighting, people crying. And all I could see was, you know, at the time what I felt was like my God, my, my everything, my, my everything, slain. You know, I knew 
knew that my world would never be the same again. All I could do was kneel next to him. Just say, Will, man, don't go. Like, I need you, man. I need you. I need, I need your knowledge. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. I watched him take his last breath, man. I watched him take his last breath. I held his hand. After Graves' death, Boyd once again felt abandoned. He had no mother, no father, and just lost his biggest hero, all at the age of nine. But following his cousin's death, the eyes of Orange, New Jersey slowly began to shift to Boyd. He was going to be the next great athlete, following in the footsteps of his cousin, Willie Graves. And in his eighth grade year, the Orange High School football coach, Randy Daniels, came to Boyd with a workout plan. And so began his journey in football. I was about four, four eight, you know, uh, when I was in the seventh and eighth grade. And, um, you know, Coach D gave me the workout plan. And when he gave me the workout plan, that's all I did, you know. Um, any downtime that I had outside of schoolwork, you know, I would hit the weight room. You know, I would go out to the football field. A lot of people, they thought that I knew right from wrong, where all I knew was hard work and reward. You know, that's all I ever known. That hard work paid off in Boyd's first game as a freshman on the Varsity High School football team. But he didn't shine at running back. It was at the outside linebacker position where Boyd first made a name for himself. Boyd scored four touchdowns on the defensive side of the ball in his first ever high school football game. As a freshman, that was a, the greatest feeling ever to get a pick six, you know, at home, in front of your home uh, crowd and, and, you know, carrying on the legacy that my cousin was having. You know, at that year, I was wearing number five because he wore number five his freshman year. So I was just still, you know, trying to find my way. And, and that game really solidified uh, what was the future for, for Corey Boyd. And the future of Corey Boyd looked a whole lot brighter than the past of Corey Boyd. Boyd would go on to become one of the most highly touted recruits in the country. He was the 21st best cornerback in the country, the 12th best safety in the state of New Jersey, and one of the top running backs in the country as well. He was finally starting to see his way out. Once I opened up the letter from Virginia Tech, you know, uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of a great road and a great journey towards my, my, my college uh, choice. Boyd admittedly did not know too much about the University of South Carolina, but all of that changed when Lou Holtz came walking in the door to begin his recruiting process. Lou Holtz did a phenomenal job with uh, allowing my grandmother to feel comfortable with uh, the whole process. Not one part of it was I alone. They preached a lot on my recruiting about uh, home, away from home, and being able to grow into a better man. Um, and I think that was more so what, what, what caught me uh, amongst all the other colleges that were recruiting me was that uh, the University of South Carolina really invested in the man. There was one thing that Boyd was still unsure about with the University of South Carolina and Coach Lou Holtz, and that was the no hair policy. Boyd took a lot of pride in his dreads, but Lou Holtz had something else in mind. He gave me an ultimatum, either I could cut my hair <laughs> and come here, or I can keep my hair and, 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 and go to another school. And uh, he left the ball in my court. He really left the ball in my court once he left my house um, on the recruiting, on, on, on his uh, visit. Uh, he left a letter of intent there for me to sign and say, it's all up to me. It was through a picture that Lou Holtz would find out who his next running back was going to be. But the day of uh, National Signing Day, you know, uh, I sent the picture to Lou Holtz that I had a haircut. When the New Jersey native made his way down to Columbia, South Carolina for the first time, 
It didn't take him long to fall in love with the University of South Carolina. And I believe my first home game, you know, when I walked out to the uh, 2001, it was, you know, seeing cocky in the, in, the, in the cage, going crazy, and the fans, and the stands, and the, the white rags going over their heads, it was, it sent goosebumps. For the first time, you know, me ever stepping out on the football field, you know, it was, I was taken away, breathtaking, you know, by the support and the love and how one minute the stadium could be empty, you go in for a pep talk from your coach and come back out, and man, it's a sea full of garnered and black that, you know, you can't describe the emotional feeling and the vibes that you get. Tears went down my eyes, man, for the first time. From then, man, I fell in love. You know, I fell in love with the rivalries. I fell in love with the fairgrounds. I fell in love with the facility. The staff already had me, so it was, man, it was, everything was a blessed transition. Boyd would go on to become the ninth leading rusher in school history and the only player in school history with 1,000 yards rushing and 1,000 yards receiving. He had come a long way from those lonely nights in Orange, New Jersey. The University of South Carolina also brought Boyd his best friend, Kenny McKinley. Kenny was one of those special guys to me, man. You know, I, uh, I had him as a recruit. When he came in on his visit, I showed him around the school. I saw that he had, we had similar, you know, traits about ourselves that I never found in anybody else, you know. And from there, I just knew that, that saying of, am I my brother's keeper, you know, it really stuck to me, you know. Me, me and Kenny went through hell and high waters his, his four years at uh, the University of South Carolina. It was a trip back from a root canal that sealed the bond between McKinley and Boyd forever. I tried to go to the store and get him some uh, some protein drinks and, and Gatorade, and he had made a joke, you know, in the middle of it all. Uh, he said that you can't buy heart in the store. <laughs> you know, uh, in a time where, like I said, he was under the influence. He just got finished getting a root canal and. When he said it, I kind of I kind of understood what he meant. That you can't buy brotherhood, you can't buy friendship, you can't buy love in any store. It has to be genuine. And it was at that moment I knew just how wise that man was. The bond that we we built because of this university would never be broken. But Boyd was two years older than McKinley, and the NFL was now in his sights. He was a projected third-round pick, but it wasn't until the seventh round that his phone rang. Coach Gruden, when he got on the phone, you know, the first thing he said was, was I ready? You know, was I ready to become a, a, a Buccaneer? You know, my whole life, you know, I watched Warwick Dunn and, you know, Mike Allstott and these running backs, you know, go out there, Ernest Graham, all of these guys go out there and play for this team that, you know, I wanted to be a part of and I actually got drafted by them. But it didn't take long for Boyd's old friend to show up at his door. Adversity came knocking. Unfortunately, the first day of rookie minicamp, after being drafted, I came out and tore my knee for the third time, man, for the third time, and um, it really set me back, you know, again, mentally, not knowing where I would be, you know, um, questioning God's path for me. Boyd would get cut by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But this would lead to one of the most life-changing moments he had experienced so far. And, you know, in Tampa, that's when I actually, you know, found God. You know, I got tired of running away from myself. I got tired of running away from the critics. I got tired of running, you know, to a point where I had to really listen to what God's word said. It was just stand, you know, stand on his word. And the only way that I could do that was to learn his word. He then began to invest in a church. 
And I always try to say, where did all my money go when I played in the NFL? But it actually went to opening up a church that I've never seen. Um, pastor Brown uh, was a female pastor who, you know, took the time to really dig deep into my spirit, dig deep into my soul. Uh, the first day I met her, the, the craziest question she, she, she ever asked me was, what does love mean to me? And at that time, I said, love means pain because everybody and everything that I've loved that's always given me pain. Several weeks after being cut by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Corey Boyd received a phone call from the Denver Broncos. Somebody was going to give him another chance to play in the NFL. You know, I was happy with just having the opportunity. And I, I, from that moment, I told myself, you know, and I said it out loud to God as well. I said, God, if you just give me this opportunity, I'll never um, be unprepared again in life, ever. Ultimately, Boyd's time in Denver was very short. He played in one full regular season game and after a season was off of the roster. But Boyd kept that promise to God to stay prepared and it paid off. In 2010, Corey Boyd took the CFL by storm. He became the league's leading rusher and was also awarded offensive MVP. He was back where he belonged. And during Boyd's 2010 breakout season, his best friend, Kenny McKinley, had been drafted by the Denver Broncos following in Boyd's path. I told him every nook and cranny of what I went through. And um, I told him that if he ever got the opportunity to play in this league, that don't ever make the same mistakes that I made. And sure enough, <laughs> he followed my footsteps, but On September 20th, 2010, Corey Boyd received another phone call from his friend Adversity. You know, it is, uh, man, not even a week later, you know, I get a phone call, you know, saying, hey, are you sitting down? Now, when somebody tells you, are you sitting down, or ask you, are you sitting down, it's never a good thing. So. You know, to hear, hey, you know, Kenny's gone, you know. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was, I mean, I, I just didn't think it was real. You know, somebody that you were just sitting with, you know, a week earlier, you know, decides to take their own life because, you know, things get too hard or you feel like you're alone in life. Like, it's tough. Till this day, I still haven't forgave myself for not being there, you know, not being there enough, you know, may have been, may have been more of a conversation on the phone or, you know, sending messages or word through my, my ex-wife or whatnot, you know, I could have did a better job as a brother to Kenny, you know, and I think that's what hurts me a lot more is because all throughout college, you know, I was, I was his backbone, I was there, you know, I was his sin eater. But when he needed me the most, I couldn't be there for him. And that still bites, it still hurts, man. Boyd felt like he let everyone down. I couldn't even face this university no more. I felt like I couldn't face his mother. I couldn't face any of my teammates. And within a few years of McKinley's death, Boyd would be hit the hardest he had ever been hit in his whole life. Another adverse time came when my grandmother passed, you know. Uh, I felt like I lost everything. I don't care how much money I had in the bank. I don't care what type of car I had, what type of clothes, you know, I, I own, you know, to your loved ones, the ones that, you know, walk you through life, you know, in your darkest moments, you know, to lose them, man, it's just like, man, you need to lose your own life, you know, you need to lose your own self, but. 
But through that pain and through the hardships, Boyd was still able to get back up and see the bigger picture. Every time I look at the kids I'm around today, you know, I see Kenny's face, I see my grandmother's face, I see my mother's face, I see all my losses. I know I can't win every battle. I know I can't win every battle, but I can't keep losing. And that's what keeps me going, that's what keeps me motivated, that's what keeps me helping these kids and being there for these kids because they all I got left. They all that I got left from what I love. It's tough when all I got left to love is a game and children that aren't mine. Boyd's mind was now on the kids and the next generation that he was hoping to leave a mark on. He was done running and ready to be coaching. Out of, the, out, of, out of nowhere, you know, I heard, I literally like how I'm talking to you now, you know, I heard God say CB3 Athletics. You know, CB3 Athletics, and I didn't understand what it meant. You know, CB3 Athletics, you know, CB3, CB3. CB3 Athletics began with three kids in Canada. And then Boyd took the program to New Jersey. But Columbia, South Carolina was the place that was calling him home. I remember the words that Lou Holt said to me on you know, my recruiting visit. And when he came to my house, he said that no matter what, you know, when football is over and it's over and done with and you, you marry big house kids and all of those things, you know, you can always come back to South Carolina. So in the summer of 2014, Boyd was on his way back down south and he was bringing CB3 Athletics with him. The goal of CB3 Athletics is to help kids achieve their dreams by trusting the process. And what's the process? It begins with an eight-week off-season training program. The program is hosted in the state-of-the-art facility in Apex Athletic Performance Center, where they have access to weights, speed and agility training, and a field for seven-on-seven -seven skills training. The first of the eight weeks is a simulated combine experience. Players will be tested for their 40s, vertical jumps, strength, agility, and their height and weight. Each player will be given his results so they can see the progress they make over the eight weeks after the final test. The next part of the process is seven-on-seven -seven skills training and then having the opportunity to earn a spot on one of the three CB3 seven on seven travel teams where the teams compete on the local, regional, Boyd is and national dream. levels against and some of the passion. nation's top recruits with college coaches in attendance. His coaching has paid off for one of the top South Carolina recruits, Elite 11 quarterback Hunter Helms. Said like at FBU, like he was just hype, and in here, I didn't expect anything less. Like he was just hyping everybody up. Like if he, if he, if he saw anybody like walking or standing around, like he was getting on them. Like I was like, hey kid, that's what we need. Like that's that's perfect here. Like even today, first day being out there, like I was talking to my running back. He was like, dude, this man knows his stuff. Like in the first day, I've learned so much about him and like so much more about football. And uh, see, like that just there is really all it's about. But what separates Boyd from the pack is the way he cares about the kids. He is involved in the community in any way possible, whether it's FBU, the Carolina Bowl, or Top Gun. He shows up at schools to present kids with awards or just to check in on them. He hangs out with them on the weekends and is that role model he lacked in his own life growing up. And that's what sticks out most to his godson, also named Corey. Not only do they share the same name, but they also shared the same hometown, Orange, New Jersey, and a very similar upbringing. So he watched me grow up, basically for 17 years. So yeah. 
Great feeling. You know, I never had really a dad growing up. He's feeling in that role, so pretty awesome. Because not too many kids get to wake up and see, see somebody like that. Through my own time building a relationship with Corey Boyd, I've realized several things. He will do what is best and want what's best for the kids no matter the cost. He is loyal to everybody he builds friendships with. It goes way beyond football for Corey because he has seen life with and without it. There is not one person with his kind of story that does what he does each and every day with the positive attitude that he brings. And lastly, his relationship with God stands out more than anything else. Every conversation I have with him and that he has with almost everybody usually ends a little bit something like this. Brother, I ain't mean to slow you down. Hey, God bless you. Listen, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna holler at you, man, definitely. I want Which is why at the end of every training session, no matter how it went, it ends the same way. With a prayer glorifying God and a message to love others because you never know how long somebody will be in your life trust the process and at the same time in due process these young gentlemen will be greater and they'll be the ones that we see on Sunday we're praying for safe travels and we love you guys I love you guys and we all say thank you to Jesus and Jesus bless holy name we pray Hallelujah. Amen. Hug somebody, gentlemen, and let them know you love them, man. That's and these prayers are heard by those above who Boyd has lost and loved along the way. But he knows that he will see them again. You know that when I get to heaven's gates, you know, all my family and, and those that I've lost will, will be there to, to vouch for me and help me get into heaven. You know, help me get into heaven. You know, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm just here to bless folks, man. And, you know, hopefully I'm making that, 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 that effect.